Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Eco Africa, the weekly environmental magazine brought to you from Uganda, Nigeria and Germany. I am Sandra Twinobdio and I'm glad to have you along with us. And here is my co-host Chris. Hello everybody, I'm Chris Lems in Lagos. Today's program takes a look at style and why keeping up with the latest trend is not so environmentally friendly. But that's not all. We see how a Mozambique town is resisting climate change. Learn why the Congo River is so filthy. And visit a French region suffering from a big water shortage. Mozambique is a country that has suffered greatly in recent years from extreme poverty coupled with political instability. Now, for many of the country's leaders, environmental protection simply isn't on the agenda. But the mayor of Beira wants to start tackling the problem, not least because the coastal city has been hammered by cyclones more and more often. They start before dawn. Fishermen in the city of Beira need to be out in the water all day to make it worthwhile. Ah, Let's go. Joao Davrio learned his trade from his father. He grew up in the fishing community of Praia Nova. Today, he heads up at the local fishing cooperative and knows just where to get the best catch. Bring it in. Bring it in. But times are hard. There are fewer fish now. The sea itself, though, it is their biggest worry. Every year, storms, tides inundate their homes. <laughs> they destroy our boats, our houses, entire villages. We need to leave, but where can we go? There's nowhere. Then there are the cyclones. The last one covered our houses in 10 meters of water. 10 meters. For the port city of Beira and its fishing industry, the sea is a vital source of income. But every November, when the cyclone season starts, it becomes dangerous. In order to absorb the destructive force of the flood waters, mangroves have been planted along the shore, which are flanked by large parks. Over the last five years, Beira has begun to restore the natural water causes and basins. The big green park at the center, covering 44 acres of land, is now almost complete. City Mayor Albano Carige has come to inspect the work. The gardeners need to trim this area again. It's dried out a bit. These green areas are designed to absorb the flood waters like a sponge, holding back the worst from the city. Beira has become a pioneer in green infrastructure on the African continent. We need to think about how we can continue living in this city, how we can cope with the challenges of climate change without creating even more problems for the city. We need to act decisively and sustainably and develop a sustainable lifestyle to our city so that Beira will be safer and more prosperous and more attractive to businesses. But it means the fishing community has to move. Prayanova is located in former mangrove swamp, which will now be replanted. Residents are being asked to move to resettlement sites in the edge of the city, like this one in the Madrozi, far from the sea. Former fisherman Leandro Mungwar lost his home and his boat to Cyclone Idai in 2019. So he moved here voluntarily. He now lives from farming and is building his own house. I will never go back. No one wants to return that way of life because it's difficult and dangerous. It's like fighting a war, not against armed men, but against water. And water is not an easy opponent. Our future is here, but not if we fold our arms. We have to work hard. 
maisha derimush na certificate the city authorities offered him and 200 other fishermen small plots of land each on which to farm and build a home it's an area that's safe from flooding and suitable for growing rice but not everyone shares mongwar optimism the house of his neighbor bernardo matelo was flattened by powerful winds Matello would rather sell fish like he used to, but that's not an option here. We can't afford to travel to the sea and buy fish to sell it here. No one could make a living that way. So we are growing rice instead, but the soil is depleted. This year we had a lot of rice, but because the rains failed, everything has withered. During a visit to a residential area on the coast, Mayor Karigi appeals for support for his plans. Wave breakers are to be built in the sea here. Protecting the city from future floods is his top priority, and he takes every opportunity to persuade local people of the need for change. He believes projects like the Green Park and the relocation of Praia Nova are vital for the city's future, and he's hoping local residents will support him. We need to use all our knowledge and expertise to pull this city out of the swamp. That's why we are organizing big projects and paying out money. Because we want to govern better and serve the people better. All with the goal of ensuring that tomorrow we are no longer on the list of cities most threatened by climate change. On the other side of the bay, the fishermen continue to work on Prayanova. At the moment, relocation to the resettlement sites is voluntarily. Many realize that it's too dangerous to stay here long term. But Jao Davrio and his colleagues find it hard to believe they will make good farmers. I don't think moving to resettlement sites is the answer, whether Ndama or Rio Maria. There's no point. Why not protect the coast from erosion and we stay here and continue to fish for a living, as the fishing corporation of Prayanova? Finding a safe place to live that is both close enough to the water and affordable is certainly not realistic otherwise. Our next report is about stylish furniture from Egypt. A startup has found a way of upcycling waste wood into new furniture. And the results give no hints of their often humble beginnings. Furniture making in Egypt is expensive. The country has no wood resources. Everything has to be imported. Normally scrap wood gets thrown away. But that's changed in Sharif Al Khalil's workshop. Together with architect Sarah El Batuti, he founded the Mubun startup. They make luxury sustainable furnishings using scrap wood. It's very important that we upcycle and not only recycle. We reuse and refurbish the scrap wood and incorporate it into a new product. That also helps raise people's awareness. These products are made without heat treatment and without any harmful chemicals. They've made more than 120 pieces since Mubun opened a year ago selling them in Egypt and as far afield as Paris and London. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. When we dress for work or an evening outing, many of us have a whole rack of things to choose from. But it hasn't always been like that. In the past, it was pretty standard for people to have fewer clothes than they wore more often. That is true, Chris. 
fast fashion is the buzzword. It has made buying clothes cheaper and easier, but it is terrible for the environment. In Germany, businesses are now looking for ways to move towards a more circular business model in fashion. Let's take a look. New t-shirt, new pants, another t-shirt, a new hoodie, hmm, and maybe another pair of sneakers on special offer. Most likely, all these new garments will end up in the trash, sooner rather than later, just like 92 million tons of textiles every year. Only 1% of that gets recycled, the true price of fast fashion. Between 2000 and 2015, the clothing production doubled. Meanwhile, the amount of time clothes were being used for, so individual items were being used for, actually decreased by over a third. This sorting facility in eastern Germany takes in a lot of unwanted clothing. But here it's treated as a new resource. Every day workers sort up to 200 tons of items based on their condition, style and type of material. It's one of the largest facilities of its kind in Europe. Garments come from all over the world through in-store collection and recycling containers. They're either sent to second-hand shops or sold to recycling firms to create new fabrics. Some 500 billion US dollars could be earned every year worldwide if the clothes industry would shift to a circular economy. There are valuable resources bound in our clothing and um, it, is, it, is, it would be a shame to not reutilize um, these re resources. We are creating value again because we are identifying items that do, didn't have the demand of the customer who previously owned it anymore. Nonetheless, there are other people who are demanding these types of garments. And that's how the value is created. The need for more recycling is growing due to fast fashion. Now, Paul Döttenbach is partnering with Mario Malzacher from a Berlin-based initiative called Circular Fashion. It's seeking to move the industry towards a more sustainable model. We are dealing with also very high valuable product like cashmere, for example, which we are able to identify by simply touching it. And um, this is in a way is, is a showcase for what's about to come with regards to material recognition, because this we can uh, identify. However, when we're dealing with various mixes, we need more precise information. When the future is, will be relevant, is it like 80% wool, is it 90% wool? Because the recycler can create much different qualities if he knows exactly this is 100% wool or he can um, combine materials which have all 80% wool so that the, the output of the recycling is um, really usable for the fashion industry again. Many of the items that end up here are no longer wearable, around 60 tons daily. Right now, most of that goes to the automotive industry, but it's impossible to utilize the full potential of these textiles while sorting everything by hand. This is where the technology developed by Mario Malzacher and his colleagues comes into its own. This is actually an intelligent sorting station, which is equipped with a scanner. And through this scanner, as soon as a garment comes to the table with an ID inside, a circularity ID, it's uh, automatically read out and we get all the product specifications and with this product specification we can calculate what is the right reuse case for this or what is the best recycling case. Workers still have to decide whether the item is wearable or not. The rest is shown on the screen. Truly circular products will one day contain information from the whole value chain. The conventional textile industry is resource intensive. It relies on oil, chemicals, and 93 billion cubic meters of water every year. The difference in a circular model starts at the very beginning of the product. It's all about, from the outset, from the design principles, ensuring that you are eliminating waste and pollution, that you are keeping products and materials in use, and you're regenerating natural systems. Take dyeing. The conventional approach uses water and chemicals, one reason why fashion is responsible for 20% of the world's wastewater. This Dutch company is different. Its facility in Vietnam dyes polyester without processed chemicals or water. 25 liters of water just to, to dye, uh, that's only one t-shirt. So if you look at a t-shirt, it would be 150 liters of water per kilogram of fabric you need to dye uh, textiles. 
Uh, this is what you save. Uh, we don't use that. They work with reclaimed carbon dioxide instead. Fabric is loaded into the dyeing vessel. CO2 is added and brought to the right temperature and pressure. Only pure dyes are used, with no additional chemicals needed. Clean dye is currently producing around 10 million meters of dyed fabric a year. That's not much compared to global demand. But Olaf Lola hopes to skyrocket production as interest in this sustainable method grows. This is also a call out to the rest of the apparel industry, but also to the consumer. And um, the solutions are there and, and start to buy them. Uh, if you're a consumer, a retailer or a brand, it's, uh, it's the same. With resources becoming more scarce, many businesses are reconsidering waste. In a circular economy, clothes are designed to be worn for a long time. After that, intelligent solutions can ensure they're recycled for maximum benefit. The transition to this mentality is slowly getting underway. Water is a precious resource anywhere, and not only in regions of the planet struggling with high temperatures, like many places in Africa, it is also an issue in Europe. In France, for example, a large company is bottling local water to sell it around the world and that's proving highly controversial. This is a fish farm, but you're more likely to find plants than fish in its ponds. There's too little water, but that wasn't always so. For centuries, water cascaded down from the mountains near this farm here in the Massif Central region. As recently as 2018, a stream fed Edouard de Feligon's ponds with a steady supply of fresh, clean water. The water from the cave used to stand at about this level. And today there's nothing left. Today the water is bottled and 70% of it is exported. The fish farmer now fears for his livelihood. He doesn't blame climate change for his plight, but rather international food processing giant Danone. It extracts mineral water from the surrounding region to bottle and sell worldwide under the brand name Volvic. Locals complain that despite repeated droughts, Volvic is siphoning more and more water from the area with no regard for their needs. Volvic rejects their claims. You must keep in mind that we don't just do whatever we want. We're subject to and monitored by the authorities, and the authorities might appear at any time to inspect our boreholes in order to confirm that the statements we make in our data are correct. In August 2020, for example, there were two such unannounced visits. François Dominique de La Rosière, a geologist, is very familiar with this region, characterized by extinct volcanoes. He says there are still plenty of natural water sources, but they're dwindling as a result of generous contracts awarded by the regional government to Danone. Le préfet. The prefect grants far too many authorizations. And more seriously, on the 31st of March this year, the prefect put in place a new drought decree in case of heat wave and water problems. And he miraculously exempted Volvic by saying it's underground water, it doesn't involve them. But many studies indicate the opposite. The flow rate of the small stream, which supplied Edouard de Feligon's fish ponds, has fallen dramatically in recent summers, in part due to the water extraction. We went from 470 litres per second or 510 litres per second in 1960 to nothing at all, and all for the benefit of Danon. For now, he hopes summer rain will fill his ponds, but that the regional authorities will reconsider the agreements they've made with Danone in the long run. Time now to head to another waterway, the mighty Congo River in the Democratic Republic of Congo, one of the world's deepest rivers. Now thousands of people depend on it for their livelihoods, but it is under threat. Yes, Sandra, experts say it's been polluted at an alarming rate due to poor waste disposal. And that's a vicious circle, as we'll see in the capital, Kinshasa. More rubbish than water. That's the state of almost all of the Congo's tributaries in Kinshasa. And every day, the mountains of waste continue to grow. 
because almost everyone disposes of their rubbish along the small rivers and drainage canals that crisscross the city. Organic waste and plastic bottles suffocate life in and around the water and clog the waterways, causing severe flooding during the rainy season. It's a situation that horrifies Alain Sabela. After learning about the damage caused by plastic waste in his meteorological science course, he founded an environmental NGO. The rivers in Kinshasa are polluted with runoff from industries and plastic waste. We plan to clean up the rivers by collecting plastics, which are then turned into art objects. I intend to start a business that will help to protect the rivers. And he's using a lot of imagination to do it. Alain Sabela knows his initiative can't solve Kinshasa's overwhelming waste problem. But he sees the decorative objects made from plastic waste as a step towards raising awareness of environmental problems. But Kinshasa's waste problem also needs to be tackled at its roots. When Belgium's built the drainage system for, for Kinshasa, you can see that uh, all the canal that were built here for drainage, the sewage system, uh, the outflow was towards the Congo River. And we still have the same system, unfortunately, today. So which means any water that goes underneath the, uh, the soil here in Kinshasa, the direct canal goes immediately to Congo River. Decades of conflict, a rapidly growing population and a lack of investment have all contributed to the city's failure to develop a functioning water and sanitation system for its 15 million inhabitants. Researchers at the University of Kinshasa test the water quality twice a year. Their findings are published in a scientific journal and also presented to local authorities to push them to take action. Céline Sikoli-Simwa is leading the research. Rapid action is required because the results are cause for concern. We have found that industries are discharging their wastewater into the Congo River. And there are a lot of factories situated close to the river. Our scientific research indicated that there is a lack of oxygen in the water. This is having a negative effect on people and, of course, on the fish in the river. In the laboratory, the scientists can detect the different toxins. But because government officials often side with factory owners, not much action has been taken so far, says Céline Sikolissimwa. And plastic waste is just as harmful. The plastics are very dangerous for the microorganisms in the water because they block the sun's rays from reaching the water. Without the sun's rays, green plants and other organisms are not able to synthesize carbon dioxide and water, which is critical for their survival. In 2019, the government launched the Kinbopeto project, aimed at making Kinshasa cleaner and greener. On the last Saturday of every month, Kinshasa citizens are encouraged to clean up their neighborhoods. 300 trucks are deployed to collect garbage and transport it to the landfills on the outskirts of the city, where it's burned. Still, the project only scratches the surface. According to official figures, the city produces 7,000 tons of plastic waste every day. But environmental activists like Alain Sabela are undeterred by the task ahead of them, even if it has to be removed one sack at a time. That's a pretty tough situation for all the people in the DRC. We do hope our show has given you something to think about and you enjoyed watching. Don't forget you can always check in with us anytime on our social media platforms. I am Sandra Twinobio signing off from Kampala here in Uganda.
Thanks, Sandra. It's time for me to say goodbye too. I'm Chris Alems in Lagos, Nigeria. But do be sure to tune in again next week. Until then, take care.